How's everyone doing? So good to be together. Wasn't worship awesome this morning? I love to worship. I love the presence of God. And the Bible says presence of God. There's fullness of life. Amen. I heard Aaron told me that this service, you guys like to talk back and, and engage a little bit. Is that true? I want all that smoke. Bring all that. I love it. Good gracious. I'm so out of breath. Let's go. All right, let's go. <laughs> hey, it's been, it's been awesome being in this series, the Signs series, learning about all the supernatural things about what Jesus has been doing in the book of John. Man, he's been healing people. He's been turning water into wine. And today, we're going to find out Jesus has more in the tank. He's not done. He's got more signs to deliver, which is going to be really fun. Before we start with the scripture, I want to ask a question just to get everyone kind of thinking in the same direction. I want you to raise your hand if you have ever prayed to God for a sign. I need a sign from God. Okay, pretty much everyone in the room. That's great. If you haven't, if you didn't raise your hand, that's totally fine. Uh, but I want to remind you, maybe jog your memory. You may have done it. You just forgot. And what, you, what I want you to think about is one of the most common places to pray for a sign from God may not be where you think it is, like the church. It's probably more likely to be in a place like your car right after you get pulled over by the cops. <laughs> Does that ring a bell? You may be wondering, how do you know that, Matt? Well, I'll confess. I'll start the, the message with the confession today. Like a month ago, I was driving. It was super early in the morning, and it was 5.30. It's dark. I'm going to a men's breakfast at a church. Nobody's out, and uh, I ran a stop sign. I broke the law. I did. I, I, I confess it. I'm not going to lie in church. I broke the law, but I will tell you, before you judge me, this is the stupidest stop sign that's ever been placed on a road, <laughs> ever. Here's why. Because it is literally 12 feet away from the next stop sign. Like, what? You got to stop, look both ways, and you're like, Burr. okay, do it again. I'm like, you know, that morning, I'm not doing it. I'm going through it. I wasn't being unsafe or anything. There's nobody there. Turns out there was somebody there. And uh, I saw the police officer see me run the stop sign. I'm like, oh, no. He pulls me over and uh, walks up to my window, and he says this. You know I got you, right? <laughs> I was like, yeah, you got me. I'm not even going to try to argue. I'm sorry. You got me. He's like, no problem. I'll be right back. I'm going to go print off your ticket in the truck. I'll be right back. In that moment, I decided this is a good time to pray. It's time for a prayer for a sign. God, I need a sign. I really can't afford this right now. And uh, maybe you've done this too. You know you're about to pray something that you really don't deserve. <laughs> like, I deserve the ticket. I'm guilty. But I'm just going to say, God, in, in Jesus' name, if there's any love that you have for me, that if you could just find it in your infinite mercy, please, God, give me a sign that you still got my back. And I don't know how you're going to do it. If you could just like supernaturally make him not able to give me a ticket, like make it impossible, and just give me a, a warning, that would be so awesome. Again, I don't, I don't deserve this. In Jesus' name, amen. Anybody prayed that prayer? I like it. You guys are honest. All right, so five minutes go by, he's not back. 10 minutes, 15 minutes, I'm starting to get nervous. I'm like, I might be in more trouble than I thought here. 22 minutes, he finally comes back to my window and he says this. Well, sir, technology's on your side today. I don't know what just happened, but all of a sudden my printer stopped working. I've been trying, but it's impossible to get that thing to print. I have to give you a warning. Yes, you know what I said? No joke. I said, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. He's like, really, bro? I'm like, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Thank you. I apologize. It'll never happen again. Prayed for a sign and God answered. I love that about being in relationship with God, which is what brings us to our scripture for today. The story of Jesus walking on the water. One of the most incredible signs ever. In fact, I would say next to Jesus dying on the cross, rising again, that this is probably one of the most well-known things about Jesus, like in the world. Like if you ask anybody, what do you know about Jesus? Oh yeah, I heard about, didn't he like die on a cross? And I don't know, he like walks on water or something. I don't know if I believe that, but I've heard that. 
A lot of people know about this sign, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they know Jesus, right? There's a difference. They may have heard about him, but a lot gets lost in translation. And that can be true of us too, especially if we're not reading our Bibles for ourselves. Like, I heard about it. I don't need to read that. We may have heard some things, but we may not understand the full story. And that's what I want to address this morning. I want to bring some clarity to one of the most popular stories of all time, Jesus walking on water. Are you ready? I want to pray. We'll, We'll dive into the Bible here. God, as we open up your word, that song's just sticking in my head. Who else is worthy? Only you, as Peter said, only you have the words of eternal life. To whom shall we go? But we run to you and to the truth of your word this morning. And I pray that it sinks deep in our heart today. In Jesus' name, if you agree, can you say amen? Amen. 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 Context, before we do this, open your Bibles to John 6. Remember, if you were here last Sunday, Pastor Aaron preached a great message about what happened on this day that Jesus miraculously, miraculously just fed 5,000 people, which with women and children, probably more like 10 to 15,000 people. He just did that. And this was a huge sign that Jesus is not just some kind of flavor of the month, new philosopher guy who's got a couple of zingers and a couple of one-liners that really make you think like, whoa, that was deep. No, he's the real deal, Amen. He's the Messiah, and there's supernatural power behind his teaching, and he just proved it. He just put it on display for tens of thousands of people. This was a public sign. The word is out. No denying it. That's what's going on as we pick up in verse 16. It says, when evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. Now, here's a couple details I want you to remember. By now, it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. Remember, he was praying on the mountain. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about how far? Three to four miles. That's, that's out there. They saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. Other gospel accounts say that they thought it was a ghost, like they freaked out. But he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. And then they were willing to take him into the boat. And then check this out. Immediately, the boat reached the shore where they were going. Immediately, just like that. So let's just stop right there and just recognize that's crazy. What? That's crazy. And let's do a couple takeaways from this. Uh, We can't really brush past any of this and say, act like this is normal, it happens all the time. The first takeaway is just really obvious, but it's a big deal. Did you know that Jesus can walk on water? Can you imagine being a disciple that day? Be like, y'all, he's been turning water into wine, healing. Did you guys know he can walk on water? That is awesome. I did not know he could do that. He can walk on water. And it's important to sit on this for a second because you can't explain it away. A lot of the signs that Jesus did for thousands of years, people have been trying to be like, well, you know, with uh, advances in science and stuff and things that we know now, he probably didn't miraculously do that because blah, 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 like they try to explain it away. Listen, how far, do you remember how far he had to walk to get to them? Anybody? Three to four miles. That's out there in the deep water. That's a long walk. This is not a mirage. It's not a magic trick. It's not a sleight of hand. Like Jesus didn't have mirrors to make it look like he's walking on water. There wasn't a sandbar that reached from the shore four miles out to the exact spot that the boat just happened to be passing at that time. And and Jesus was really like tiptoeing on the sandbar. It looked like he was walking on water, but he really wasn't. None of that. He actually walked on water. How many know that Jesus is above the laws of physics? Amen? Amen. And when you're the guy who created everything, even the water right there, apparently you have the power to walk on top of it, which is just awesome. I just want to sit in that for a second. That's the takeaway. That is awesome. Write it down. He can walk on water. Now remember, it says that they were frightened. What did Jesus do for them? This is the next takeaway. He calmed their fears. Calmed their fears. But how he does it is so deep and cool. 
What he says in the translation I read is from the NIV translation. It says, it is I, don't be afraid. That's not the best translation of, of what he said. If you go to the original Greek, a better translation is Jesus saying, fear not, I am. Some of you are like, what's the difference? And that's okay. The difference is massive. In that moment, for those Jewish guys in the boat, that just was like a bomb went off in their heart of like, <gasps> you know why? Because he's doing the exact same thing that God the Father did in the book of Exodus thousands of years ago when Moses, their hero, was at the burning bush and he has the fear of God and God says, I am. Him. And he identifies himself as God over creation. And if I want the bush to be on fire and not burn up, I can do that because I am. And Jesus comes on the water in the same way, says, fear not, I am. And he is identifying himself to them in a way that would resonate more deeply than anything else. I am God and I'm claiming my power and authority over creation. Isn't that amazing? So if I want to walk on water, I am. And when you hear Jesus identify himself to you like that, I am, your fear goes away. It's powerful. Isn't that so much better than they just be like, hey, what's up? It's your boy Jesus. And they're like, oh, great, Jesus is here. I guess I'm a little less scared. No, I am. He calms their fears. Next thing we see is that he gets in the boat and it says... They arrived immediately at the shore. Just, and then the story just goes on. Like they don't even talk about that. Like he just arrived. They, so Jesus knows how to teleport and he could take people with him. Again, I bet they got to the shore like, did you guys know he could do that? That is awesome. And I've read that story a thousand times and I've never really put it to, like he can teleport. That is an incredible sign of his power. And I like to ask sometimes, why did Jesus do that? Why did he choose to teleport? That's awesome, but why? And we don't really know the answer, but my guess is he had compassion on these guys who, as you remember, they had just spent all day helping hand out piece by piece bread and fish to 15,000 people one piece at a time. They're exhausted. It's the middle of the night. They've been rowing into the wind for four miles. Probably think they're not going to make it. They're exhausted. My arms are spaghetti. And Jesus is like, I got compassion on you guys. Let's just get there. Boom. We're there. Can any parents be like, I wish I had the power to teleport when my kids in the back row are like, are we almost there yet? Wouldn't that be awesome? I just think that's cool. Another interesting thing that we see, this is only in like the intro of this story, guys. Another interesting thing to note is who's not mentioned. Do you know who's not mentioned in this story? Can you shout it out? Peter. Peter. For those of you who don't know, the other gospel accounts tell the same story. Jesus walking on the water, and Peter's in the boat, and Peter sees Jesus, and he's like, Jesus, is that you? Jesus, if that's you, Call me out, and I'll come out. I'll walk on the water too, like I will, I swear. And you can just see the disciples like rolling their eyes like, dude, Peter is crazy. But he's like, I'll do it. And Jesus like loves the faith. He's like, right on, Peter, come on out, it's me. And you know, it's almost like one of those early accounts in the Bible of like, hold my beer, bro. And he gets out on the, and starts walking on water. Or maybe hold my wine. They probably didn't have beer back then, right? He does it. John. Did you forget that happened? <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Why wouldn't you mention that, John? Again, we don't know the answer, but it's really interesting to research this a little bit. It's funny. Some scholars believe that the reason he didn't mention Peter is because they believe there was like a brotherly rivalry competition thing going on between Peter and John. It's like like a beef that they had. And the reason that people think that is so cool. If you just fast forward in your Bible a couple chapters, John 6, go up to John 20. You see John writing the story of Jesus dying, going into the grave for three days. On the third day, the stone gets rolled away. The ladies show up at the tomb. His, his body's not there. They freak out. They go back and tell the disciples he's not there. And they take off running to see if it's true. And in John chapter 20, John says, this is so funny. 
he says, he tells the story like this. The apostle who Jesus loves, moi, <laughs> took off running with Peter uh, to, towards the tomb. And the apostle who Jesus loves outran Peter and I got there first. So just in case anyone was wondering, for the rest of eternity, anybody who reads this is going to know that John is faster than Peter, and if you ain't first, you're last, Peter. Like, isn't that ridiculous? Does anybody have sons in the room? Raise your hand. You got sons? I have three sons, and I see this all the time. We'll be at the grocery store, and we'll be walking out to our car with pushing our food, and my, kid, my boys don't even have to say anything. They just look at each other, like they make eye contact, and they're like, they just, they're racing. They take off. Anybody else's kids do that? I'm first, shotgun. Same vibe here with Peter and John. It's hilarious. And so maybe John, back at the walking on the water story, maybe, we don't know, but maybe John was like, you know what? I've had about enough of Peter being the center of attention all the time. And I was walking on water and having the right answer and cutting people's ears off like the other guys can write about that. I'm going to leave him out, which is just hilarious, right? I mean, only a brother would do that to another brother. So these are some, uh, some really interesting things that we take away just from that first part. And we're going to continue the story now to see how people are responding. So we're going to go to verse 22. Are you guys still with me? Yeah. Okay, up, up in the cheap seats, you guys good? The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realized that only one boat had been there and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples, but that they had gone away alone. So they just noticing like something's off here. Something doesn't make sense. Then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. Okay, a couple of quick takeaways. People are taking notice. There's still excitement from the day before. I mean, he fed 15,000 people by multiplying food. That's amazing. They were looking for Jesus. They didn't want it to end. They wanted more. And all of us would agree that this seems like a good thing. Right? There's like momentum building around Jesus. Thousands of people are, are following him now and they're excited and, and seeking out like this is good. So let's see what, what they say when they get there. Verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? So they're starting to like connect the dots. Like, hey, so you're here, but you were there in the boat and that seems impossible. What? When did you get here? And you would think in that moment that Jesus would say something like this, like, hey, guys, you just rode across the lake to see me? That's all. I remember from you yesterday, from all that stuff. That's cool. You came. High five. I'm so glad to see you. Let's see what he actually says. Very truly, I tell you, you're looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. And he recognizes they just worked really hard to get there that morning. He says, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man, which is me, will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. They're probably like, what now? That's not what I was expecting you to say. Just worked really hard to get here. Jesus is like, you guys, you just want me to make more food for you. It's been 12 hours since I fed you. You're hungry again. You're not interested in me. You're interested in fill, filling your bellies. Kind of have this attitude like, feed me, feed me. Feed me, Jesus. I'm here. And guess what? Jesus is like, I'm calling you out on it. I'm calling you out. Now, this is a key moment for all of us to insert ourselves into this situation and just kind of ask yourself the question, how would I respond in that moment? How, what would I do? What would I say? Because if we're honest, when it comes to our relationship with God, even with our relationship with church coming on a, on a weekly basis, isn't that really all of our temptations too? Right? So many of us come to church 
with this same attitude. Feed me. Feed me, pastor. Feed me, worship team. Give me that good song today. Oh, I don't like that song. Come on, feed me. Right? I've been that guy. And as we read on in the story, we see that the people who have this type of feed me attitude with Jesus, guess what? They start to fall into things like grumbling and complaining, it says. Isn't that interesting? Listen, when we come with the feed me attitude, it's very easy for us to do the same thing, to fall into grumbling and complaining. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever known it's somebody at church who's maybe a little bit of a complainer? You guys are liars. Come on. (laughs) A little bit salty, right? The person who shows up and it's just like, I don't like this. I don't like that. Right? The music is too, whatever, fill in the blank. The preacher's too old, can't relate. The preacher's too young. Which one is it, right? I don't get anything out of that preacher. He doesn't feed me. I don't grow when he preaches. Have you ever heard anybody say that? Not here, definitely not here. How about this one? I don't think I can go to Southeast Christian Church anymore because it's just too hard to get out of the parking lot when it's over. I'm I'm out of here. I don't like that. Or what about this one? The coffee bar doesn't offer pumpkin spice lattes year round. And if they don't change that, I'm out. I checked, they do actually offer pumpkin spice lattes, but that's not the point. Feed me, feed me, right? It's ugly, isn't it? It's not a, it's not a good look. And this is what these guys are, are doing to Jesus. And Jesus is like, I'm calling you out. Are you really here for the right thing? Or do you just want your bellies filled? He says, do not work for food that spoils. So now they're starting to get a little offended. And in verse 28, they're like, all right, we'll play your game. Uh, So what must we do to do the works God requires? Like, dude. And then Jesus, in a very loving response, he's the good shepherd and also incredibly clear, says this. The work of God is this to believe in the one he has sent me, has sent. To believe in the one he has sent. Now I want to zero in on that word believe because we have a different understanding of what that word means than what they heard that day. Who said that? Come on, bro. You know my notes. That's awesome. I'll explain to everybody else in a second. Um, what we would understand, believe, like, oh, yeah, I believe Jesus is real, whatever. I'm like, I, I know that he existed. What next, you know? But you know that the Bible says even the demons believe? Is that what Jesus is saying? Like, demons, are, are they good because they believe? Absolutely not. Again, the Greek word that he used there when he said, you must believe is this word, pisteo. That definition is to entrust, especially one's spiritual well-being to Christ. Pisteo, believe. To commit, to surrender to, your life. So those guys heard Jesus say that and they knew what he meant. He's like, you need to give your life to me. And they're like, oh, excuse me. Can I get some bread? Right? Like, What? Listen, this is not just an acknowledgement of the truth, but a surrender to it. And there's a big difference, right? So let me ask you, have you surrendered your life to Jesus yet? Pisteo. Have you truly committed your whole life to him? Or are you, if we're honest, if we're just here to get our bellies filled? Convicting stuff. Jesus is laying it down. And so now they're officially offended in verse 30. And they ask him like, well, this is such a defensive thing to do. What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Can you imagine the audacity of saying that to Jesus? Not even 24 hours after he just performed one of the biggest signs in history. You know, back where he multiplied the fish and the loaves, it probably still smelled like fish. There's probably still bones in the grass. There's probably still crumbs laying all all over the place. And they're like, well, what sign are you going to do? You asked me to give my life to you. 
Isn't that amazing? And then they get all self-righteous and start quoting scripture and they're like, our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness as it is written. I don't know if you've heard this story. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. In other words, they are calling him out right back to his face. They're like, you think you're the Messiah? Prove it. Prove it. What other magic tricks do you have up your sleeve, Jesus? Got any other signs for us? You want us to believe. Obviously, Jesus has a pretty serious reaction to their demand for a sign. And I want to look at just another gospel to see, kind of lean into Jesus' heart on this issue. If you go to Matthew 16 real quick, we see the same thing playing out, but with a different group of people. It's the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I'll read it to you in verse 1. The Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and what does it say? Tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. Like, do a magic trick, Jesus. Come on, let's see, see what you can do. You skip down to verse 4 just for time. It says, uh, Jesus responds to them in an incredibly convicting way. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign. Ouch. And he says, but none will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. And then he just walked away. Like mic drop, talk to the hand. The answer is no, except for the sign of Jonah. So hold on a second. I'm a little slow. I'm trying to figure this out. Why is Jesus rebuking them for demanding a sign? And the answer is this. There is a big difference in being desperate for a sign from God versus demanding a sign from God. You see that? Y'all, y'all have been there. I know I've been there in that moment where you're desperate. You're desperate for God to do something in that moment when you have a loved one in your family who's gonna die. And the, and the doctors can't figure it out. There's nothing else they could do. They throw their hands up and you're just like, God, and I need a sign. Please save this person. Only you can do it. And I'm desperate. I love him. Ever been there? Or give me a sign right now or I'm out. Do it my way on my time. Ooh, that's ugly, right? This is good. That's really ugly. So you got to ask this question. Why does Jesus do signs if it's creating this issue? Again, it's really a simple answer because signs and miracles build our faith. They build our faith. It reminds you that there's something bigger than you out there, which is good, right? They, they point you to the miracle maker who is Jesus. And I want you to catch this, catch this right here. It's so important. The miracles are the fruit of an almighty God, but they are not God himself. It's what he produces, but it's not him. And so often we could do, I just give me another sign. I want another sign. Give me a miracle. And he's like, dude, have you even talked to me today? Right? So the rebuke comes because, as a great pastor Gary Hamrick said, they were so obsessed with their own physical demands that they weren't even interested in spiritual truth. How many know that sounds a lot like the world that we live in today? Right? People just walk around. They're like, don't tell me about your truth or the truth. I have my truth. You have your, your truth. In fact, your truth is offensive to me. Can you just take care? Give me what I want. Feed me. Feed me. Feed me. Don't tell me about your truth. Feed me. Does that strike a chord of conviction within anybody's heart today? <laughs> it does mine, man. I've been there. I've been that guy. I, I confess to you. I've been the guy going through life like, what about me? What are you going to do for me? Jesus isn't having it. It's not having it. Okay. So let's bring some clarity to this. The issue is not that signs are bad. It's not, that's not the issue. The issue is how are we going to respond to them? Desperate or demanding? If you keep reading, you see that instead of worshiping Jesus as the king of kings, which is like the logical 
thing to do. If you, if you see Jesus walk on water and teleport and multiply food, I mean, it just seems logical. Like, dude, you are the Messiah. I worship you. I loved the songs today. It was so good. Who else is worthy? Nobody like you. Like, that, he's it. And we just call, that's why we lift our heads and worship. Like, you're the man. You are the, the Lord. We worship you. We bow before you. That's the logical thing to do. But instead of doing that, the people in this story, it says they start to complain. What? They become quarrelsome. They start fighting amongst each other. What? It says they turn away from Jesus and some of them even desert him. Isn't that incredible to think that in light of all of these signs, it's not just this one today, but from the weeks that you've been studying, all of these signs, people literally desert Jesus. We have the luxury of being removed from from that time by a couple thousand years. And it's easy for us to read this and go, I cannot believe those people are so immature. If if they're watching Jesus do these signs and then they desert him, I would never do that. I would never do that. I just want to help you before you think you're too good for that to happen to you. Remember that these people literally walked with Jesus. And they still deserted him. Even Peter, it's hard to get closer to Jesus than the apostle Peter who literally walked on water and experienced a miracle himself. When the pressure was on, what happened? He denied him. Man, that's got to make you look in the mirror and say, what would I do? What am I doing? Pressure is on, y'all. So, After they have this argument and they demand a sign, good news comes. Jesus starts to connect the dots for everyone. So pay attention. This is the good news, okay? I know it's been convicting. Verse 35, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Not just the bread from yesterday. He says, whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you've seen me. You were there yesterday. And still you don't believe. But here's the good news. All those, listen to this church. All those the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. I want to sit on that for a second. Listen, you came to church today. You made the effort to get up in the rain. Or you tuned in online. You're paying attention. God the Father is drawing you. And you come to God today, he will not drive you away. You come humbly and honestly, I need a sign, I'm desperate. The answer is yes. For I've come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me that I shall lose none of all of those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. Will you be there? For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes, what was that word? Pisteo? And believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Somebody say amen. This is the good news of the gospel. He is the bread of life. So much better than regular bread. So much better than pumpkin spice latte. Amen? Amen. So with that in mind, I want to take communion together and celebrate the bread of life. I'm going to release our communion team to go ahead and get those trays. And listen, y'all, if you could just start serving right away while I'm talking. Don't wait for me to stop. That'd be awesome. I want to get these elements into your hands as quickly as possible. I want you to look at them and hold them, and you're going to obviously taste them and and get them inside of you. It's so important to catch this. It's the good news that Jesus is the bread of life. It's a big sign what we're about to celebrate, communion. You may have come to church today looking for a sign, but I want to remind you, when it comes to demanding a sign, what did Jesus say in Matthew? He says, no sign will be given to you 
except the sign of Jonah. Anybody know what that is? Jonah, if you don't know the story, was a dude just like you and me who didn't want to do what God said. Like, I'm going to go the opposite direction. I'm literally going to do the opposite. And he got in trouble and a fish swallowed him. That's a bad day. And he was inside the belly of that fish, so to speak, buried for three days. Sound familiar, right? For three days, buried in the belly of the fish and then calls out in repentance, God, help me, I'm desperate. And God makes the fish spit him back out and then goes and changes the world. And that was a huge sign too to all the people in Nineveh. And they repented. It was awesome. But Jesus said, I'm going to give you a sign, the sign of Jonah. That had already happened. What did he mean by that? He's, I, he means this. If you're looking for a sign, you hold in your hands the bread and the juice, which represent the body and the blood of Jesus, who was crucified, died, and was buried like Jonah, buried in a tomb three days. And on the third day, come on somebody, he rose again, defeating death and paying the sacrifice for your sin and my sin. It's amazing. This is why we celebrate and worship. This is why we turn it up, man. I love Jesus. It's amazing what he did. That's the sign of Jonah. What else do you need? I don't need anything else. Jesus, you owe me nothing. Can we get to that place in our heart where you can honestly say, Jesus, you don't owe me anything? Wouldn't that be amazing? What a life that would be to live. You owe me nothing. I'm just grateful to be counted as forgiven and one of your sons and daughters. So as you hold that in your hands, the, the bread and the juice, these signs, I want to close with the words of Jesus in verse 43. I believe he's saying it to you and me today. He says, stop grumbling among yourselves. Stop it. No one can come to me unless the Father who has sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. The Father is drawing you. I want you to say yes to that, that pull you feel. He gave Jesus as the bread of life for you. He wants your sins to be forgiven, like just wash it clean. He wants you to give your life to him. Pisteo, believe, commit, surrender. Choice is yours. What's your response?